Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's free community seminar. My name is Sherry Belknap. I will be your presenter tonight. Um, just so that everybody knows, in front of me is a camera that they're going to be taping tonight's program. If you don't, if you have a question, it will pick it up. If you don't want it to be heard on the camera, because it'll go on their website, um, just stop afterwards when the camera's done, and I'll answer any questions that you have. Um, this is a fourth seminar in the series of eight that the Genesee County Bar Association is, is putting on. Um, you should receive a list in your packet of the seminars that are upcoming. There's one on pet law, real estate, disputes with your neighbors, and I think there's a Family Medical Leave Act and American with Disabilities coming. We want to thank the Flint Public Library for allowing us to use their facilities tonight and to present and keep this on their website for future use. Also, the Genesee County Bar Foundation for underwriting the expenses for it. Also, the Legal Services of Eastern Michigan for partnering with Genesee County Bar Association and providing some of the packets that you have tonight. There's a couple people that I'd like to thank for assistance in providing the information that I'll present to you tonight. And that's Judge Herman Marable Jr. of the 68th District Court. He provided a top 10 do's and don'ts from his courtroom and his perspective. And I want to thank Ann and Eileen for helping with uh, getting the packets and everything set up tonight. Tonight's presentation is with regards to the Small Claims Court top 10 do's and don'ts. I, as a, as a litigation attorney, added some useful information that I use on a pretty much daily basis during litigation that may assist you. So I'm going to get, the way I have it set up is not necessarily in order of importance, but in the order that you're going to come into contact with them during the small claims process. So the first, there we go have to get used to the toy. The first do is to seek resolution before filing the lawsuit. Send a letter to the opposing party telling them what you're looking for, why you're looking for it, and send it by certified mail return receipt requested. What that does is it keeps, if you keep a copy of your, for your records, you staple, what I do is I staple the little receipt that you get to the letter. When you get the card saying that they've received it, I staple that to the letter so that I can show if I go to court that I sent this person the letter, they've not responded. Also, another suggestion, in addition or without doing the letter, is mediation. And what mediation does is it's an opportunity to meet with the opposing party in a safe, confidential place and discuss it with a mediator. Mediation also gives you an opportunity to state your point of view, to listen to each other. Recently, I had a case where both parties were stuck in their position. We went to mediation, and the mediator was able to help resolve it. Each party got to say their piece, tell the other how they felt, and the mediator comes up with ideas that maybe you haven't thought about. The mediator is a neutral third party. He's not going to tell you who's right. He's not going to tell you who's wrong. He or she will help you facilita facilitate communication. And hopefully with the mediator, you'll be able to work out an agreement. In Genesee County, the Community Resolution Center is a service that assists parties with mediation. It's located at 315 East Court Street. It's the Genesee County Bar Association Foundation building on the second floor. I believe there should be some information in your packet with regards to the Community Resolution Center if you're interested. With that said, in order for mediation to work, both parties have to be willing to listen and communicate. But like I said, I had a client who was steadfast. The 
plaintiff was steadfast, but we were able to get it to work. So you have to kind of be willing to go in there and listen to the other side. If you decide you can't come to an agreement with the opposing party, small claims court is where you may want to go. However, if you go into small claims court, you waive the right to be represented by an attorney, the right to a jury trial, and the right to appeal the court's decision. Unless you go before a magistrate, there is no appeal. Also, consideration should be given to the fact of the money limits. For most claims, you can only sue for up to $3,000. That does not include your court costs. However, if you're in a car accident and the other driver's at fault, then the limit is $500. So when you initiate the small claims lawsuit, you're gonna to go to the court clerk, get the document that you need to fill it out. And this is where number two comes into play. When you get the small claims affidavit in form, it's, the court form is DC84. When you fill it out, if you can, type it because there are gonna be multiple people reading this claim. The judge, the clerk, the opposing party, anybody who wants to see what the small claim is going on, possibly a mediator if the court has a mediator come in. If you cannot type it, print or write neatly. I know I have horrible handwriting since I became an attorney. I've seen other people with horrible handwriting. So write it as neatly as you can because if nobody can understand what you're writing, they're not gonna be able to understand what your claim is about. So that's where my reinforcement is. Remember somebody else is gonna be reading this. This is the small claims affidavit and claim that you're gonna fill out to initiate the lawsuit in small claims court. You have to list the information for the plaintiff, the defendant, how the parties are, the date the claim arose, the amount of money that is claimed, whether there was a previous action or not. The reasons for your claim, this is telling you that you have a limit of $3,000. You give up your right to recover more than the limit to an attorney at jury trial and appeal the judge's decision. You sign this form before a notary. Yes? Is there any statute of limitations in terms of small claims? It's probably gonna be, it's the same as any other statute of limitations for claims. If you have a breach of contract, unless the contract shortens it, it's six years. If you have a conversion claim, it's three years. That is if somebody takes your money and converts it or takes the property and converts it, it's three years. So it depends on the type of action that you have, what the statute of limitations is. Yes? Could you elaborate on the conversion, define the conversion theory? I go to your property, take your wheelbarrow, take it to my house. I don't have permission. I know it's not mine. I know I don't have the right to take it. So I'm converting your property to mine. All right, so you loan somebody a lawnmower, they don't bring it back, same theory? You can argue it whether it will be successful because you did give it to them willingly. That's gonna be the argument that the other person says is he loaned it to me, I just didn't have a chance to get it back. There was no time frame that I had to use it. So the judge is gonna hear both that, pros and cons. Yes? If you send a subpoena, certified mail, and they don't show up, can the person just ignore it? Or can they say after three years we destroy our records or something of that nature? Are you talking a subpoena for production of documents or? For documents. I've had people ignore it. One of the things with serving a subpoena by certified mail is you do it restricted delivery if you're doing it to a person and you want their records. And they see only. Right. So, and they sign. If they sign for it and they don't produce the records, then you go to court and ask for what's called a show cause hearing. And they have to show cause why they haven't produced those documents. But it's been over three years. Is that 
that no. that's gonna be probably an unreasonable amount of time to wait to enforce that subpoena. Or are you saying you serve? When did you serve the subpoena? You want to talk later? Yes, I <laughs> okay. would like to. Okay. Okay. Got one more thing. Okay. Sorry. If I loan somebody some cash mm -hmm. and they signed a note saying that they borrowed this cash from me, yes. How long do they do I have to recoup it? Six years from the date they breached the contract. Okay. So if you if they haven't paid in a year. I probably wouldn't wait six years, right? Because you may have a hard time finding them afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I know when clients have come to us near the six-year mark, there are difficulties trying to find the opposing party. If they don't make the payments, my suggestion, you know, wait three or four months and then file suit because then it's you probably have a better chance of finding them. You may have a better chance of collecting if it's closed. But then collection is a different animal. The first step is getting that judgment. Once you get the judgment, it's trying to find the money. Right. So that I uh, have some tips at the end for collection. Verbal agreements, as in verbal contracts, what's as far as the statute of limitations and how binding and how much weight they carry in court? Verbal contracts are, verbal agreements are contracts. The issue you come up with is it can be a he said, she said type of argument. You can say, this is what our agreement was. I agreed to buy six apples from this person, and that person come in and say, no, I agreed to buy three, and this is what I bought, here's the receipt. So when you don't have it in writing, it becomes more of an evidentiary issue as opposed to whether there's a contract. Because the judge is gonna listen to you, you're gonna listen to the other side, and the judge has to determine who's credible, who's not credible, and determine what the facts of the case are. And you could be true and honest, the other side can be true and honest from their perspective, and the judge has to figure out what the facts are. And as plaintiff, you have the burden of proving your case. So if the judge says, I think you're credible, I think you're credible, you haven't met your burden. And that's where you, you come into problem. That's why writings are always good. So Any other? Basically, it turns. I'm sorry. Oh, it, sorry. Basically, it turns on the amount of credible evidence you can present to buttress your case. Right. If you have witnesses, you're going to want witnesses there. If there's something to show that this is this is what happened, judge. Here's the evidence to show this is what happened. That's going to help you. And if you can do it in writing, that's the best. Always. Oh, write it out in written form to present it? Right, because all they, what the, if they say that they didn't write it, they didn't sign it, you can get a handwriting expert oh. and determine whether, that gets a little bit more costly right. and it's probably not a small claims thing, Right. but there's ways you can try and prove it's the person's handwriting. But you should present it to the judge in written form rather than verbal? Yes. For his... The con if, if both of you agree that's what the contract was, yeah. there's not going to be an issue. Right. If you disagree as to what the contract was, right. then it's going to be an issue. Right, but when you file the complaint, you file it in thorough written form for the judge. You don't rely on verbal testimony to make your case. No, you're going to testify, and I'll get to that in a little bit. This is, this is just starting the case. Right. The small claims affidavit and claim is just initiating the case with the small claims court. Right. You fill out everything. The defendant has to be served with it. The defendant can answer. Right. Um, when the hearing date is set, that's where you present all your evidence. Right. And you do it in verbally. You'll be sworn under oath. The judge will hear the testimony from the witnesses, look at all the exhibits you have. Right. And he or she will listen to everything. Right. But is it a good idea before when you file your complaint, is it a good idea to file a brief along with it outlining the highlights of your case? You can. Um, whether the judge will have an opportunity to read it before the hearing? No. Um, he may or may not. Most of the judges in Genesee County are very diligent in their reading the cases before a case is called. Um, but doing that also, if if the defendant is served shortly before the hearing, it may cause that first hearing date to get adjourned so the defendant can have an opportunity to respond. 
So it may not make it as quick as a resolution as a small claims usually goes. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, uh, about a month ago, I had someone to uh, run into my gate. Okay. It's not, it's my property, but it's not uh, property that my house is uh, connected to. Okay. Um, come to find out that the car was stolen. They hit the gate and they took off and they left. Um, how long did I have to um, try to, uh, uh, how would I go about uh, dealing with that? I mean, you said $500, it wouldn't be worth it, you know, for me to try an automobile. Right, it depends if the person was insured at the time. Um, <laughs> And, it, and with a stolen vehicle, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And if there wasn't a police report issue to tell yes. you who the person there was, so they yes. found who the person was. Yes. Um, I would send a letter to that person to see first if they, most likely they won't. And one of the other things you might want to do is, are they going to be collectible? Um, one of the big concerns that I've always advised clients is, Okay, we may be able to get a judgment. We may get a default judgment because they don't appear. The next step is trying to collect from them. If you cannot collect from them, you've paid the filing fee, the service fee, you've lost the money for the damage, and if you try to collect through a debtor's exam or a subpoena for a debtor's exam, you're spending more money. So well. Right, that you may not get back. So it's something that you have to weigh the benefits versus the, the not so good things to determine whether it's beneficial to you to file. Did, did they leave the car or take the car with them? <laughs> they left the car. I called the police. The police came out and the police told the car away. Right. And they caught the people who stole the vehicle? They didn't say. Hmm. They just gave me, the, they gave me the owner of the vehicle. Yeah, and if the owner, if it was a stolen vehicle, it might, you know, depending on whether the person gave him permission. Do your homeowners cover that? The property is not uh, uh, vacant connected, land. but it's vacant land, yes. Oh, but it, there's a gate on it? Yes, it. yes. Okay, number, wait, you had a question. <laughs> Sorry. You are getting back on the time frame of things. How about if you were flying the Seward Township? Depends on what your cause of action is. Statute of limitations is based on a cause of action. One thing you have to be considered with governmental agencies, if you're arguing a tort like negligence, assault and battery, things like that, they may have governmental immunity. So you may want to make sure if, if it's something that's more barred. A zoning issue? A zoning issue? That didn't get taken care of? By a zoning ordinance that was passed. I'm trying to think what the with zoning rules, there are times that there's administrative procedures that you have to exhaust first, and there are certain timelines with those administrative procedures. Um, for instance, if you wanted to appeal a property tax issue. You had where I'm at, so that way you don't have to keep on guessing. Okay. What, what it was is there was a zoning variance that was made for, for a property that was not originally zoned that way, and part of the restrictions on doing such was to erect a fence. The township never erected, had the owner never erected, the township never forced the owner to erect a fence. And my question is, can I still do a small claim? Just to give this something out of Small claims court may not resolve your issue because what you're asking the court to do is equity. You're trying to force the person to erect the fence, right? I'm trying to force the township to force the person to erect the fence because the township stated in their zoning that it had to be done for this person to rezone the property. And the result that you're asking for, you cannot get small claims court. Okay. Because small claims court is the $3,000 money damages or the 500 for the accident. What you're seeking is equitable. You're asking the judge to order the township to do something. Whether or not you can, because I'm, I'm not gonna give legal advice on whether or not you have a case, 
but you're asking for the judge to force them to do something. You're not asking for money damages. So that would probably be a circuit court case. Well, in essence, I'm asking them to give me $3,000 because they didn't do what they said they were going to do. Okay. I'm not, I, I don't want to... I don't know if you would be entitled to damages for them not putting up the fence. And without getting more information and diving into it a little bit more, I don't want to tell you yes or no whether you have a case. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Number three issue is venue. Making sure you sue in the right court. The 68th District Court is for the city of Flint. Not anywhere else. Not Genesee Township. Not Flushing. Not Fenton. It's just the city of Flint. And when you're looking at a mailing address to determine what court it is, just because it has a city of Flint mailing address does not mean it is in the city of Flint. Don't worry, attorneys have a problem with that as well. I had an attorney from Birmingham sue my client in the 68th District Court. He lives in Genesee Township. So those are things that you're going to want to make sure you're filing in the right court. Also, if you're in the outlying areas, 67th District Court is broken up into districts. You have one in Mount Morris, Flushing, Davison, Burton, Grand Blanc, and Fenton. So there's a sheet in your packet that tells you what area is 67th, which court covers which area. If you ever have a question, you can call the court. Or if you're internet savvy, the Genesee County Taxation website, go to the Genesee County Treasurer's Office, go for property tax, you can pull up their property tax information. It tells you what municipality they're in. So it kind of helps you narrow down where you need to file suit. Yes. Is Fenton Township considered part of Flint? No. Flint Township is actually the 67th District Court in Flushing. So you're wondering where to file. You should file your claim where it arose or where the defendant is established, resides, or employed. What I normally do is if the defendant resides in the city of Flushing, I sue within the city of Flushing. So you want to try and file in those courts. You have to make sure you're proper. Again, if the defendant resides in the city of Flint, file it in 68th District Court. Or if the defendant resides in Mundy Township, 67th District Court in Grand Blanc. This is where the district court will be put on the small claims affidavit. If it's 68th, you put the 68th in front of it or 67th. In addition to venue, making sure the parties are correct is also important. Make sure you are the proper party. Make sure you have the right to bring the claim. You can't necessarily sue for your mother unless you have power of attorney, conservatorship. So you have to make sure you are the person who has the cause of action. Also, you want to make sure you have the cause of action against the defendant. If you did business with a corporation, your cause of action is against the corporation. In some circumstances, you may go after the individual. There's times where if they don't list their name properly, like you do business with ABC Company Incorporated. That's how they're registered with the Corporations Bureau. If their contract that you entered into says ABC Company, I've been known to sue the person who owns the business doing business as ABC Company because technically they're not using the name of the company correctly. But also, if they have an assumed name with the Corporations Bureau, they may be allowed to do business that way. So you want to make sure that you're suing the proper party and that you are the proper party. On the small claims affidavit, number one is listing your information. And number two is listing the defendant information. Number three is telling them how you know the facts of the case, whether you're the plaintiff, partner of the company, or a full-time employee, whether the plaintiff is an individual, a partnership, or a corporation, and whether the defendant is an individual, a partnership, or a corporation. If 
I'm going too fast, just let me know. Or, yes, am I going too fast? No. <laughs> a little bit. You're, you're moving. But um, the question I have basically reverts back to the statute of limitations. Okay. Um, like a non payment of wages for like a, uh, a labor contract, you know, I mm -hmm. want you to like do my roof. And okay, I'll do your roof for X number of dollars. You do the roof and the final payment never comes. Is that a six year contract or is that a three year? It is a six year contract um, because it is a contract for home improvements. Uh -huh. um, and if you do not, there's another issue if you are the contractor. Pardon me? If you're a licensed contractor mm -hmm. and you did not get paid within 90 days of providing the last materials or supplies or labor, the contractor, if they're duly licensed as required by law, can file a construction lien on your house. Mm -hmm. um, they have one year after reporting the construction lien to foreclose on your house. So there are other ramifications if you're not paying your contractor that could involve putting a construction lien on your house. Right. So they, go ahead. Oh, no. So they have six years. Even if they don't foreclose on that lien within the year, they can still come after you for breach of contract for failing to pay them the amount they're due under the contract. Right. They file a mechanics lien against the property, and then they have a year to initiate a claim on that lien. Right. And if they let that lapse, then they still have a the remaining six year period to file a lawsuit in, right? For bre breach of contract, but not for foreclosure of a lien. Right. And if they did not file for the foreclosure of the lien within the year, you can go to the county clerks, you fill out an affidavit with them saying they haven't commenced proceedings. The county clerk will then give you a certificate that you can record with the register of deeds that then discharges that lien. But you have to wait that year out. What if? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what if the homeowner is acting as their own contractor and you're acting as an employee under their direction? It can be a contractor, a subcontractor, a supplier, or a laborer can put a lien on your house. Okay. And does it also fall under the six year term? For the lien on your house, it's one year to foreclose on the lien. And employment. For a, I'm not sure what the statute of limitations are for if it's different than the six years. Right. I don't handle employment law. Right. I do handle home improvement contracts. I right. haven't had too many clients who have had a laborer sue them mm -hmm. for wages. So I don't want to guess on that right. answer. Right. <laughs> I understand. Okay, number five is you want to explain yourself. On the small claims affidavit, you get some information where you need to explain why you're filing suit. You want to do it fully enough so the judge understands why you're filing the suit. I entered into a contract with the contractor. He breached the contract by not completing the work. My damages are this. That tells them you're suing on a breach of contract. So you want to give them enough information so the defendant understands why he's being, why he or she is being sued. And that location on the small claims affidavit is number nine. If you need to attach a longer explanation, you can attach a document to it, a supplemental sheet, and the judge will take that into consideration. But remember, whatever you say in that document can be used against you if your testimony changes at court. I don't know, my dad loves Judge Duty. I don't know how many people watch Judge Duty. She's nailed a couple people in their affidavits when they testified differently. And trust me, these judges will hold that to make you look uncredible. That's not even a word. Uh, we'll check your credibility if you testify differently than something you write because you are signing this under oath. The next step is service of the small claims affidavit. You have to get it to the defendant. You can have a process server serve them. You can send it certified mail, return receipt requested, restricted delivery because you don't want the wife to sign for the husband or the kid to sign for the parent. And you as a party cannot serve the defendant because you have a little vested interest in getting that person served and not showing up. So the court doesn't even want to put it in your hands. You have to have somebody else do it. 
Yes. Certified <coughs> mail restricted delivery takes a takes the place of a process server. If you can get service. Right. I always try a process server because then I have somebody who's willing to testify. This is the person I served. Right. Um, if you're a prevailing party, you may be entitled to court cost, so you may be able to get it back. Yes. If a person is a process server and never actually serves this, and the, they go into court and the defendant doesn't know. If the, I'm assuming the processor is going to do his job and give an affidavit of due diligence showing that he's made attempts to serve the person, you can ask for another court date and the court most likely will give you another court date to try and get them served. And if you can't get them served, then he, doesn't, he or she would not have knowledge of the, the case and your case is probably going to be dismissed and you may have to refile it and try serving them again. Okay. My husband had a state truck. Um, it was the battery went dead in the parking lot, and I was on the lot for a period of time. At the time he was there, mm -hmm. I was on the lot. He had an injury with his well, anyway, he's crippled. He couldn't get to the truck. Um, the lot was not posted in any manner. They took his truck, and I spent 15 minutes before the, I don't know, the deadline or whatever, and they said, you don't have an attorney, that's it. And they took his truck to Ann Arbor, charged, they had towing fees and so much that it was, by the time we found out where it was, it was more than the cost of the truck. What, did, they, the truck. did they take the truck because they were collecting on a judgment? No, they took the truck because it was in this man's parking lot and another person who posed for the police told me they have to have it posted that it will be towed or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't posted. Okay. And that's been a period of um, about four years. So we get the truck back. Will you get the truck back if they it's been paid. impounded for four years? The fees are probably the, the, well. The people, no, the people that impounded it kept it, rather than the city police impounding it. An outside agency did who has a an outside property. agency. We went to the police. We we report. I reported it stolen, and it was not there. My husband went in to the hospital. He slipped and had a head injury, and not on their property. And he was in the hospital, and and we couldn't find, couldn't find the truck. Most likely, if it's been in storage for four years, um, it's going to cost way too much to get it out. Well, the man that owned the parking lot took it. Right. Um, so we'd have to pay him the storage if he took it, though he didn't have his lot posted at all. It it depends. Um, I'm not familiar with. With having to, the towing in the trucks, that's not my area of, of law. Um, you may want to talk to an attorney who may be able to give you advice on that as to how to proceed. But I don't want to give you the wrong advice. Okay. Um, gut feeling is waiting four years to act on it might be a little late. Well, I asked the court. It was what 50 minutes before closing time before I found, and I hadn't been. He had been served, I had, he had been served definitely, he was in the hospital. And she said, you have to have an attorney, you can't do this yourself. And I had an attorney call, and the answer was no. We lost, we lost the truck, though it had his identity, phone number, address, everything in it, with the registration. Um, <laughs> And they could have contacted, no one contacted us if we had the truck or anything. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that area of law, and okay. I don't want to misinform okay. you. Sounds um, I mean, it sounds like, yes. yeah, you've got a pretty, you know, you'd have a good claim if you could get somebody to take, to get somebody to take, take action on it. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know whether you have a claim or not, so you're going to want to talk to an attorney who, who's experienced in that area. Okay. 
Once the defendant is served, the defendant may file a counterclaim against you. In order to file a counterclaim, the defendant must file a verified answer stating the new matter. Um, if the counterclaim is brought, the court may, keyword is may, grant a continuance uh, upon request of either party. If the defendant has filed a counterclaim that's over the small claims limit, the defendant may commence action in, in the court that has jurisdiction over that, depending on what the damages or the relief sought is. File a response with the court to notify them that they've done that, and your case will be removed most likely from small claims court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, yes. Okay. Also, the defendant does not have to stay in small claims court, even though you've chosen to start there. A defendant can file a demand in removal from small claims court to take it to general civil because then if they don't want to waive their right to an attorney, they want a jury trial, if they want to be able to appeal the judge's decision, they want to go to general civil. And they're allowed to do that by filing a demand in order for removal. What, what about general civil? General civil is small claims court is where just basically we call people who represent themselves attorney speak is pro per. You're representing yourself in small claims court. No attorneys can assist you in small claims court. When you go into general civil, the relief is up to $25,000. You can have an attorney, you have a right to a jury trial, you have a right to appeal the judge's decision. If a claim gets removed from small claims court, then the plaintiff can amend their small claims affidavit to ask for more damages if there's more damages. Say you have a claim for $4,600, you want to just resolve it in small claims court, you're willing to just accept $3,000. If they remove it from small claims court, you can ask to amend your complaint and ask for full amount of damages. And basically if they amend it out of small claims in the general civil, they can have an attorney represent them and you will have to do likewise or you will have to take your own self against an attorney. Is that true? That's right. If they want to have an attorney, you can still represent yourself. Um, you're going to be held to the same standards of knowing the court rules. Some judges give you leniency. Some will hold you to the same standards. They're going to hold you to the same rules of evidence as I will have to abide by in the court. So uh, I had another incident, and oddly enough, it was about four years ago, a police car bagged into me. They took um, information from the computer. Mm -hmm. They said that I ran into them. Um, they said I was at fault. I called my insurance. My insurance company said, forget it. They paid for uh, $2,800 for it. But then I had the $500 deductible. And, you know, would uh, civil court, uh, general civil be where I would take that? Or would it be too late or what? Uh, incidentally, I did go to the ombudsman and, and I, uh, the, um, this place where they, they, they the uh, city of Flint? Yes, the, well, the, um, yeah, the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. And he did uh, find out evidence that the policeman did not have the seat belt on. He was going backwards and that he didn't have his lights on. Uh, he had several infractions. But, you know, when I tried to go to my insurance company, the insurance company said, forget it, file a claim. They wouldn't bag it. And With a motor vehicle incident involving a governmental agency, as I explained to him earlier, there are certain immunities that are given to governmental agencies. <laughs> I'm not saying that it, so that it applies. There's, there's five exceptions. One's a motor vehicle. One's a sewer backup. Um, a hospital function, a proprietary function, highway function, highway exception to it. There are certain requirements for each exception to work that you have to do in their certain timelines. For instance, with the sewer backup, as you can tell, I have a property background. <laughs> with the sewer backup, you have to give notice within 45 days of the incident to the, the municipality that you're going to file a claim against. If not, you kind of lose your rights to do so. So you want to make sure 
if you have not checked the statute for the governmental immunity, you want to make sure it still applies and that you haven't missed the timelines that would bar your case. That's the way here. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I don't know for particular because I haven't had that issue in my uh. practice. I'm a, I handle collection cases against debtors. I handle bankruptcy, estate planning, and litigation when it involves real property. Home improvement contracts, mortgages, foreclosures, boundary disputes, that's my background. So I don't want to give you wrong advice. So if you have a question as to whether or not that exception for the motor vehicle would, it, would get through the governmental immunity, you may want to talk to an attorney as to whether or not you've met the requirements under that exception. Yes? Couldn't he take the individual policeman to the civil court, but it probably cost him more than $500 exactly. to take all that? The governmental immunity statute may cover that police officer. So he's still got to investigate all that. Right. You want to make sure that you've met the so statutory requirements so because sometimes governmental employees are covered by that immunity. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are. Without knowing the specifics of that statute, I can't steer you in, in that direction. But you may be able to find an attorney who can. Uh -huh. <laughs> no. No. It may cost more than the five hundred dollars. <laughs> so you, you do have to kind of weigh the, the cost and the benefits of, of proceeding in, in litigation, even when you have an attorney. Sometimes the cost of the attorney is more than what you would get in a lawsuit. So is it worth you proceeding? Those are things that you have to take into consideration. And as an attorney, that's those are the things I point out to if my I client. I get it into court just to get at that policeman that is illegal. It would be worth it, right? But if you're not I would pay for it, if you're not the prevailing party, they can get cost against you. Yeah. And if you file <laughs> a frivolous case that you're barred from bringing, they can, if they have an attorney, it's reasonable attorney fees and costs. <laughs> so you may be out of pocket more than that five hundred dollars. <laughs> so you want to do your investigation before you file the suit. Well, well I had, again, I had the bunchman to do the investigation, and they use police records. Right. I, you may have the facts, but whether the law backs up those facts is the question. <laughs> I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Real quick, if they file a counterclaim against you, a countersuit, yes. it has to be related to the matter, right? They can't just pull something out of the air and or can they? I've seen people try it. Yeah. And Sometimes the court will do it just to get, if it's the same parties and it can be resolved at once, the judge may hear both right. because it may be an offset. Uh -huh. um, I've had cases where I've had clients get sued for the foreclosure of the construction lien where they have multiple addresses in the same construction lien case and it has nothing to do with my client. It's just for judicial economy because all the same issues are the same, uh, you know, Right. We can parcel it by the party. So it all depends on the judge. But they couldn't say, well, I want to sue him for some kind of other unrelated thing unrelated to this case, could they? They can try. And the judge will have to determine whether it's judicially, if it should be held at the same time. Right. If whether it can be, or if it's going to be too burdensome, or whether it can be split into another case. Most likely in small claims, if it can be heard within the small claims matter, the judge may listen to it. If you ask for it to be split, it's going to be up to the judge. Well, I've been out of luck because I had the, the tag from, I had two vehicles, one number off. I had to tag from one vehicle on the other one. So I had to call and get my son to bring the right plate for that. Yes. You push that. That's the way up. Did I answer your question in a way? <laughs> a lot of it's going to depend on the judge and what kind of facts that they're trying to bring in. If you're filing for a breach of contract and they're filing for you hitting them, the judge may say it's two separate matters and right. can be heard separately. Right. Or the judge may say, let's have a hearing on this issue, then let's go and talk about this issue. Right. Depends on how the judge and the timing goes. But they can't just cook something up and say, I want to sue this guy over yep. this. And, and <laughs> it has no, oh, I'm sorry. They're, they're, is it possible for them to do that? It is. <laughs> when a person files a complaint, 
Yes. The clerk is not checking the veracity of the statements. Right. The clerk accepts it, takes the payment, the defendant okay. gets served. Right. It is not necessarily from every party's perspective when they're getting sued that that's a correct lawsuit. Yes. So unfortunately, when they file a lawsuit against you, if you do not answer it, yes. they can get a default judgment against you if right. you're served. Right. So you're going to want to answer it even if it's baseless. Because no. if they get a judgment against you, they're going to try and garnish your tax try to garnish your bank accounts, garnish your state tax refund, seize your property. But what I'm asking is when you file your small claims action, you said that they, they're welcome to file a countersuit. Correct. Attached to that small claims action, right? Correct. And what, that's what I'm asking you. They can't just say, well, he stole my bubble gum and I want to sue him. Or, or he, he can file it. Oh, and then the judge is going to have to determine whether it's going to be heard at the same time. Well, if if right? you get notice, say he serves you with the counterclaim the day of the hearing, yes. you can say, Your Honor, I just got served with this counterclaim. It has nothing to do with the with what I filed my lawsuit on. Right. In order for me to be able to effectively defend this right. and get witnesses to it, I need an adjournment. Right. Or I ask that these cases to be separated. Right. You can do that at that time. Okay. And then the judge is going to determine whether or not it's adjourned. Okay. All right. Yes. I was going to say a good example of this gentleman's car situation. He wants to get the money back from his deductible for $500. He puts in a claim. That cop all of a sudden counters us and says, oh, I hurt my neck because I hit your car. Right. So then it's and, no longer a small claims matter. Right. It's probably up in circuit court well, for over 25. Well, the point is there's two different really issues here. But he can start tacking on, like, they're, oh, I got hurt in that uh, accident. They're, they're kind of part and parcel because it happened out of the same transaction. Mm -hmm. not, well, it's not a transaction, but the same occurrence. Right. It happened out of the same thing. You got hit. He got injured. It's arising right. out of the same accident. The thing is, be careful what you file for. It might expand right. into something that you really don't that want. That wasn't correct. the part that the police officer said that he wasn't hurt on his police report. He lied already, so what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> it's just an example. <laughs> okay. you trust him to say that? <laughs> now we're coming no, up to the small, small claims hearing. And you want to get all your evidence in a row. If you have a witness that is going to help prove your case, you want that witness there. So number six, subpoena your witness. Ask the court for a subpoena to have that person come, have that person served with a subpoena to testify in court. I've had <coughs> cases where you talk to the witness, they're really supporting your position, but they don't want to testify. So they don't want to show up. So you either have to force them to show up with the knowledge that they may not be happy with you, or take the chance that they're not going to show up. If you subpoena them and they're served according to the, to the rules, then they don't show up. You can say, Your Honor, I served this person. I need them. Can I ask for an adjournment to see why they haven't come? I can't tell you what a judge is going to do. It depends on the circumstances as to what's going on. If it's the fifth adjournment because a witness is going to show up, they're not going to grant you a continuance. If it's the first one, they may. The court may not look at a written statement. So if your witness writes out a letter to the judge as to what they're going to testify to, it's hearsay. Some judges are a little bit more lenient. Some are going to hold strict to the law. And what hearsay is, it's an out-of-court statement made for the truth of the matter asserted. Basically, Ann tells me the sky's blue, so I go to court and say, Your Honor, the sky's blue because Ann told me. That's hearsay. And if she writes it in a letter saying, Judge, the sky's blue, and I give it to him, that's hearsay. So the judge is going to want to hear it from the witness. Because the judge, I've seen Judge Marable in 68 District Court, will question the witnesses. And so will Judge McCabe, <laughs> Judge Conover, Judge Odette. They're going to want to know from that witness's perspective what they have to say, but they also want to know things that they need to decide the case. So just because your witness is writing a statement doesn't necessarily give enough information to the judge. What? Yes. What about sworn affidavits? The issue you're going to run into is, again, if the judge has more questions. Right. Or the other side has a right to ask questions, too, sometimes. Right. Um, so if your witness isn't there, the other side doesn't have a right to confront. Right. Hmm. 
If you need to compel a witness to testify, this is the subpoena. You're going to check the box under people of the state of Michigan, that's for criminal cases. You're going to check the box and write who the plaintiff is. So if I checked it, it would be Sherry Belknap, then the defendant is whoever you're suing. You bark the civil box. This is where you put the person's name and address that you're subpoenaing, so who you're going to subpoena. Then you can bark where you want them to show up. The court address above, which you put up there, the date, time, and what they're going to do, testify at trial, produce documents, and then usually the person signing or requesting the subpoena, and usually if you're not an attorney, the judge signs this, or the clerk, and that gives the authority to make them appear. Number seven, your first impression to the court is what you write on that small claims affidavit. Your second impression is when you go to court. So dress for success. Dress as if it's an important event. Dress appropriate. I've seen in some courtrooms, the judge does not like t-shirts. We'll make you put on a jacket. The, there's one, one lady that stands out that went to court. She had a sweater where it buttons right here with nothing on underneath and short shorts. The judge went and talked to her. Sent her home, told her to dress appropriate and come back. So you have to, to show respect to the judge. Show that this matters to you. Wear a dress shirt if you can, dress pants. Um, like I said, there's some judges in one county that if you wear jeans, they won't talk to you. So dress because you're making an impression to the court. Also in Genesee County, unless you are an attorney, no cell phones are allowed in the courthouse. Say that again. No cell phones in Genesee <laughs> County are allowed in the courthouse unless you have a driver's license and a bar number to show the bar card and your driver's license as you're walking through. You will have to leave the courthouse. They will not hold your cell phone. If you get caught with the cell phone, because there are some outlying courts that you don't get stopped by a deputy or have to go through metal detectors, if you are found with the court with the cell phone, they'll confiscate it and you have to pay to get it back. <laughs> Do not bring food or drink into the courtroom. Number eight, remember the judge is always watching you. I had a case where I was the defendant's attorney. There was a witness testifying at court. My client kept hitting me, kept talking to me, wouldn't let me listen to the testimony. Went back in chambers and the judge commented how distracting he was, how inappropriate it was because he wasn't letting me listen to the testimony. So the judge is always watching what you do in the courtroom. So respect it, respect each other. Be on time to court. Do not carry conversations on in the courtroom. Even though you're sitting in the back and you don't think the judge can hear and you're whispering, the judge can hear you. If you're at 68 District Court in the temporary courtroom, it's a very small room. Most of the courtrooms are very small and they have recording equipment going on. So if you talk, it picks it up, which makes it difficult for the court reporter. When you're addressing the court, stand. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Sherry Belknap. I'm the plaintiff in this case and wait because the defendant has to do the same thing. Be composed and calm. Don't go up there gripping the podium, shaking it, and you know, starting to yell. The judge can hear you. You're not that far from him or her. But speak loud and clearly because you are being recorded. If it goes back to 68 District Court, you will also be on camera. Do not interrupt the judge or the opposing party. Let them finish what they're saying. And if the judge is speaking and he's about ready to rule, don't say, but your honor, I have this to say. Just say, your honor, may I say something else? And he or she will tell you yes or no. Don't be rude, because that is the, one of the biggest pet peeves of all the judges. Do not be rude to the judge, the court staff. If you get rude to one of the court clerks at the window, it will get back to the judge. Wait for your turn to speak. Number nine, 
Be organized. Be organized when you present the facts to the judge. Try, normally what I do when I present a case is I tell a story. You want the judge to know how you came into interaction with the defendant, what happened during the interaction, and why you're there. Include dates and locations if you know them. And if you have exhibits, make copies for you, the judge, and the opposing party. Because then everybody can look at the same document at the same time. If you're going to present an exhibit to the judge first, give it to the defendant or to the plaintiff if you're the defendant and make sure they see it before you give it to the judge. Judge Marable will stop you and ask that you do that. And a couple other judges will do that as well. Number 10. Accident cases. In cases involving an accident, all parties should bring their proof of insurance. It should be for the time period of the accident. Not what happened today, it's when you were involved in the accident. Or bring proof that the other party doesn't have insurance. If you are successful as a plaintiff, you will get a judgment. Or if you're successful on a counterclaim for a defendant, you will get a judgment. This is the small claims judgment. It has the party's names, who it's for, who it is against. If you guys agree to a judgment, you mark consent. If it's after trial, you mark that. If you're a defendant and you prevail, you ask for the dismissal. It'll list the damages, the cost, and everything, and the judge will sign it and both parties will get a copy. If after 21 days, the defendant or the plaintiff, whoever is told they owe money, does not <coughs> pay the judgment in full, the next step, the big hurdle, is collecting on it. There's different ways you can try to collect on a judgment. One is a debtor examination. Sometimes it's also called as a creditor examination. That's where you serve the defendant with a subpoena, have them come into court, and you ask them questions about their date of birth, their assets, do you own real property, who do you own it with, your bank accounts. You find out what all their assets are to find out where you can collect. A periodic garnishment. If you know where they're working, you can garnish their paycheck. If they have a garnishment already on there, you won't be so successful. But if you do get a garnishment, you can take about 25% of their check. If you do, they can request a monthly installment order, which will limit it to a monthly payment. Sometimes $100, sometimes $200, depending on what their income and assets are. You can garnish bank accounts. If you know where they're banking, you can send, after the judge signs it, a non-periodic garnishment to a bank account. You can garnish state tax refunds. That's a separate form in itself. You can request an order to seize property. The judge signs it, sends a process server who's duly authorized to seize property. They go out to the house and they seize vehicles. They can seize tractors, things that you, they may be able to auction off and pay your judgment on. They also collect their fees when they auction it off. Yeah. If you're involved in a car accident, you can request that the court, you can request the court for an abstract of judgment. What that does is it suspends the defendant's driver's license until he or she pays the judgment. You must wait 30 days after the judgment date before you can get an abstract of a judgment. In order to obtain one, you will need to know the defendant's full name, date of birth. And I left off my hand. You will also need to know other information with regards to the defendant. I have some tips that I use when I'm looking at filing a lawsuit against a person. First, I check to see how many other lawsuits do they have. You can look at the Genesee County Clerk's website to see if they're doing business under assumed name. <coughs> and if so, you might be able to find an address if you're having problems serving them. You can also check the 67th District Court Records Check. You can check for civil cases. You can also check for criminal cases. 
if you check for criminal cases, you can sometimes get information that you may need to get an abstract, like a date of birth. Seventh Circuit Court records, you can check to see if there's any civil or criminal cases filed in circuit court. This can possibly lead you to a file to find an address. Um, you can check to see what entries are in there. If somebody else had a garnishment, you may be able to go check the court file to see what information they have for that garnishment. Genesee County Taxation and Assessment. Tell you if they're delinquent on their taxes. Can tell you where their addresses are that they live. Usually you can tell if they're living there, it's usually 100% principal residence exemption, usually. Also, if you want to check to see what type of property they own, you can go to Genesee County Register of Deeds if they own property in Genesee County. That will also tell you if there's liens on their property, federal or state tax liens. If the person is deceased, you can check to see if that person has a probate case where you may want to make a proof of claim. That's Genesee County Probate Court. Also, if you are doing business with a contractor, residential contractor, a real estate appraiser, a surveyor, an engineer, you can go to the State of Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Growth, Energy and Economic Growth, and this is all in your packets. That will let you check to see if the person is licensed. Also, if it's a corporation, you can go to the Department of Labor, Economic, Energy and Economic Growth to check to see what the corporation's name is, if they have any assumed names, who the resident agent is, and the address to serve them. If you're looking at doing business with somebody, you can go to the Better Business Bureau and check to see if there's any complaints against them, if there's problems doing business with other people, how they resolve complaints. These are things that you can do before and after you file a lawsuit, before and after you do business with somebody. You want to investigate the person that you're doing business with to see what their criminal and civil cases are like, if there's any complaints. Also, if you go check their license and there's complaints on their license, if they've been fined, revoked, suspended, it'll tell you on that as well. Any more questions? <laughs>